there were some days when I would look in the mirror and cry at the fact that I thought about food more than I thought about my children. I thought about food more than I thought about anything. So can you first start by mm -hmm. just sharing how you feel right now? I feel excited. I think not knowing is a, is a wonderful, kind of scary place to be, but it's a good place to be. Mm -hmm. Can you now talk a little bit about what you think your style says about you? I've never felt very stylish. That's been a big insecurity for me. When I was a young girl, I made a movie called Manhattan and Diane Keaton was in the movie and she's an icon of style. What it must be like to know that you want to look that way, mm -hmm. that you're going to dress that way, that you're going to, you know, wear your pants high and you're going to put a belt on and you're going to cinch it up and you're going to, you know, you're going to wear those clothes and you know that's your style. Mm -hmm. I never had that confidence. I'm okay with who I am now. Mm -hmm. I really actually like me and that took a lot of years to come by. I enjoy my life now in a way that I didn't even know how to. I didn't know that you could enjoy your life. I thought I was happy because I existed and I had survived a family that most of them don't survive. What are assumptions that people make about you based on your appearance? People do assume that because I'm tall, blonde, and healthy that I have no problems. I have a name and she must be totally together and, and no problems in her life and wealthy. <laughs> I mean, I have the childhood totally. that I had. I come from seven suicides, but it doesn't, I know it doesn't define me anymore. Can I take him my jacket? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm so hot. <laughs> okay. What has been your biggest struggle? Body image and food. Food was such an issue for me. There were some days when I would look in the mirror and cry at the fact that I thought about food more than I thought about my children. I thought about food more than I thought about anything. I watched my oldest sister, Muffet, who is still alive and is schizophrenic, bipolar, and secondary suicidal tendencies. She was beautiful. She was absolutely gorgeous. And then when she went on medication, she became very heavy. My middle sister, Margot, who was a model, she went from being like this girl in Idaho to being one of the top models in the world. She began to spiral from that kind of adulation and that kind of attention. And as she spiraled, she got heavy. And I also watched my father gain weight when he would drink a lot. So in my mind, if you got heavy, that meant you were crazy. And I really associated being heavy or fat or whatever it was in my mind with I've lost control of myself. If I could control my body, I could control my life. Mm -hmm. I could control my brain. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work like that, obviously. But it tortured me. It tortured me for the longest time. I would fast and then break a fast and eat boxes of, you know, organic cereal. <laughs> it was back in the no fat days. So I didn't eat fat for 20 years. And counting the calories of it, I went through that stage and then I had to quit doing that. But I was so not healthy. I was so tortured. Food tortured me. And I would pray, please just get, relieve me from this obsession. Many years go by and I have kids and I'm still secretly doing that and pretending like I'm gonna raise you know, healthy children and say, oh, this is just your mom's issue, don't worry about it. I mean, from a kid to 40s, I was probably depressed every day of my life and did not know it. And my family was depressed and they were self-medicating their depression with alcohol and I was self-medicating depression with controlling everything in my life. And I didn't make that correlation until well into my 40s. My grandfather, Ernest Hemingway, took his life. His father took his life. My grandmother, which is my middle name sake, Hadley, her father took his life. A great uncle, I think a great aunt and possibly an uncle, though my cousins say that it wasn't suicide. And my sister Margot took her life in 1996. 
we were having dinner at my dad's house in Idaho and it was in the spring. I got the call and, you know, is Mr. Hemingway there? And my dad was like at the store or something. And I said, no, but this is his daughter, Marielle, may I help you, blah, blah, blah. And he said, we believe that your sister has taken her life or has committed suicide. And they said, your sister Margot. And I said, oh, you mean my sister Muffet? Because I thought, of course, that it was my sister who was not mentally, you know, well. I thought, sure, that he got the wrong name. They said, it's a possible accidental overdose. And my father never let that go. In his mind, because he had lost his father, in his mind, it wasn't suicide. It couldn't be suicide. Not another person in his life leaving because he felt inadequate or that he did something wrong. Mm -hmm. So he never, he just like, it, even when it came out publicly, it was suicide, all that stuff, he was like, never. We never discussed it. And I feel so bad for my dad because, because I know that when you are a child of somebody to take, I just know from watching my father, you always feel like you weren't good enough to stick around for even when you're an adult. And his hearing started to go really badly after that. So interesting, like you don't want to hear, you don't, you know. What was your personal response to like something like that happening and how out of control that must have felt? We had a very challenging relationship. So there was a lot of guilt around how I felt I'd been with her. It was almost like being an only child, being the youngest with these older siblings who were so different from me and their life seemed to unravel because they couldn't control it. Right. You know, I kept thinking, oh, right. I'm making such good choices. I'm healthy and I'm this right. and I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat just specifically. You thought you could like really gonna... yourself, like mind yourself into not, and not into to not falling, into not unraveling. Whatever, to not unraveling. I would become obsessed with holistic doctors to a point where I would call them constantly. I tried to make everybody that I followed like my friend mm -hmm. so that I wouldn't feel so bad about how much I needed them. I would get so obsessed with somebody that I thought if they died or something, I will fall apart. So I've followed all these people. I've been in sweat lodge, I've sweated, I've chanted, but close to towards the end of me going through my guru, follow everybody stage, I went to India. It was this trip with all these really like erudite, amazing humans. And we're going to meet His Holiness, the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala. So he's sitting next to me here. And it was so fascinating to watch somebody who was so incredibly humble, intelligent, and completely didn't care about what he had to say. It wasn't about him speaking. And I get up and he takes his hand and he puts his hand on my hand and he says, he looks me in the eye and he puts this big old smile on his face and he says, you're okay. Wow. <laughs> it was from that moment that my life started to change. Not because he right. did some spell on me yeah. or did moved energy or did whatever. It was because I finally heard myself. And then what I realized was, I was my own guru, I was my own teacher, I was my own trainer, I could eat food. It was life changing. Wow. Because I, I really did know he was right. And what's changed in my life is that I actually feel as though I'm living in myself with those revelations constantly kind of unveiling themselves to me, meaning I am present. I'm in an amazing relationship and I didn't know those existed. You can't share with another person. You can't grow with another person until you've learned how to be you. There are some things that I still am being tested on, like even right now and- Like what? It don't, it don't, it's funny that this would be so embarrassing to me. I'm financially really super challenged right now. Um, and that's a misconception about who I am. Like I'm part of a family that make, you know, has a lot, I'm not part of a, of a family 
a state or anything like that. That's kind of the last thing in my life that is, you know, like, I think that's my sense of like, Am I, are you really ready to be free? My entire family, like they didn't survive. They didn't survive. So if I have everything, if I am okay, then I left all of them behind. Oh my God. Why in your, in your body, in your skin, in your journey, why is it a good place to be? I mean, the truth is if we can't be in our own, Body, where can we be? It's a gift. And that's why I'm so into being healthy, truly. I used to actually equivocate saying healthy as being, you know, like that was a little bit of losing control. <laughs> like, oh, mm -hmm. healthy people, mm, I wanna be skinnier, a little bit skinnier than a healthy person. Mm -hmm. I had some ma messed up, mm -hmm. like, definitions in my mind of what was gonna make me feel good about this about this body. And, and this body has been incredible to me. I mean, I'm blessed. I've been blessed, you know? And I didn't, I didn't give my body credit. I didn't say thank you. I mean, I was in movies where I played an athlete and I was able to do it and I'm 57 and I can still hike up mountains. He takes me rock climbing and I cry because I'm scared. <laughs> but my body does that. And I never gave it credit for being so amazing. It is so, they're gifted. The fact that we get up every morning and we eat food and we do the things that we do and we abuse our bodies and it still comes back, mm. you know? And we don't thank our bodies mm. enough for getting, this is, the, this is the vehicle for the journey. I'm Lily. And I'm Elisa. And we're the mother-daughter co-founders of Style Like You. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the What's Underneath Project, brought to you by Third Love. Third Love is a lingerie company that is dedicated to offering bras for every body, no matter size, shape, or age. Third Love offers 78 sizes, including exclusive half cup sizes. We are so grateful to Third Love for supporting us in bringing this new season of the What's Underneath Project to life. If you agree that facades separate us and being radically honest brings us together, help spread the movement for self-acceptance by sharing this episode and subscribing to our YouTube channel. And don't forget to click the bell so you're aware of every time we drop a new episode.